Hello everybody, so in this video I'm going to be talking about what you need to build your first Rails app and also the different gems that you might want to add and the libraries you might want to consider when you're building this app. If you don't have Ruby on Rails already installed, you're going to want to set it up for your computer. So there's a lot of guides online that you can look up. Just look up Ruby on Rails, install, and then specify the platform. So depending on what platform you are on, so if you're on Mac, you just do Mac. If you're on Linux, then you put like the Linux version, like if you're on Ubuntu or the distro for Linux. And then if you're on Windows, it's a little bit more complicated because Windows doesn't work very well with Rails. So you could just install it from like the default terminal, like the PowerShell, but it doesn't work very well. There's a lot of libraries that have issues on Windows. So rather the best, like the way that people usually do it on Windows is you set up WSL, which is a virtual computer. And you see I have a Ubuntu shell inside of my Windows computer. And this gets mounted just right on, like if I go and open up my file explorer, I can see Ubuntu right down here in like the Linux section. And it just gets mounted. And also I guess this gets, this is where my Docker containers also show up. But the ones that I created on Ubuntu. So it's kind of cool. And then inside of the Ubuntu shell, it's just the same as if you were in a Linux computer. All right, so now that you have Rails installed, uh, you can check if you have Rails installed by typing Rails-V in the console. And if it returns a Rails version, that means that Rails is set up. So from there, you can create a Rails app by typing Rails new, and then just putting the name of your app. So if this is like, you know, first app, you can call it anything, it could be any type of app. I'll just call it like first, or maybe like demo app for YouTube. And then there is a few different options that you can set, but in its most standard form, this is what your Rails command will look like. You don't even need to specify anything. Like there are things like the database and the CSS framework that'll make it easier if you set it right here, but you don't have to. We could just do it without any options and it'll still set up the app and install everything, get it working. But then from there, we'll want to think about those additional components, like adding a library for CSS and styling. So now that the command has finished running, we can CD into the app. So we're CD into it. And then since we, since we didn't specify any frameworks, we actually would just start the server with Rails S. So usually in my videos, I'm doing bin dev, but that's because I'm using Tailwind. But if you're not using Tailwind, then you only have to do Rails S. So it makes it a little bit easier too. But then you start the server, and when you open up the browser, go to localhost colon 3000, you'll see that you have the Rails logo, and everything is working as expected. Now if you don't want to host it on port 3000, you can change the port too by saying dash p and then we could put it on like port 80 oh except for i think there's already something on port 80 yeah i guess we don't have permission to can we do 3001 i guess we can so see now it's not open on 3000 it's actually open on 3001 so you can do all sorts of custom stuff like that you can make it run on a specific port and there's lots of different options you should look into so to find like more information about this you can just look up the documentation so maybe like rails server documentation because that's the command that's rails s is short for rails server and we should be able to find more options about it like yeah see here's all the command line basics we can go to server I don't think it tells us all of them, but I guess if we go here, I think we can do Rails S and then dash dash help. Okay, yeah, now it shows us all of the options. This is pretty cool. So see, we have the port, we have the binding. That's neat. So we can actually change the IP if we want to make it, if we want to force it to go on a different IP. There's a config file. Oh, we can make it do a daemon, which means it'll run in the background. So it won't like hold up See right here, it's holding up the console access, and we have to do control C. But if we run it as a daemon, it would just do it in the background, which is kind of interesting. 
It also says we can log to standard output, which is, that's what it already is doing by default. But then if we wanted to like skip logging, we could do that. There's a few different options, so that's kind of cool. I just like to learn more about all the commands I'm doing. Anyways, so if we want to see a different screen, instead of seeing the Rails logo, we have to change the root of the application. So to do that, let's open up Visual Studio Code. Oop, I'm just going to open this up and I'm going to just click open folder. And now if, if you start off, you might not be in the uh, Ubuntu side of your code. But like I said, it gets mounted. Although I can't see it here. That's kind of weird. It does get mounted though. We just have to figure out like the Ubuntu. See, so like if you can't get to there, you might have to like search up for like wsl.localhost. I don't know, but that'd be kind of difficult. So another way is from inside the terminal over here, you can actually type code dot dash dash remote, and then it'll open VS code in that app. And the dot, the dash dash remote is important because we're in the Ubuntu shell. But if you're on Mac or you're not using like a virtual computer, you don't need the remote part. Just do code dot. <laughs> Although I've had some issues on Mac with like the code. Because when you install new stuff, sometimes it's like if you install the app on Mac, you need to set the the variable for the, for the terminal for it to work. So usually code isn't defined for some reason for me. But in Ubuntu on Windows, it actually does work. So I opened up the code here. Oh, we actually have a few different windows open, but I only needed this one. So then I can go, let me full screen it. And let's open up the config and go to the routes.rb. And we just need to set ourselves a root. And a root is gonna, it's gonna set like the root uh, uh, URL of the app to go to a certain controller. But right now we don't even have any controllers. So we need to create our first controller. So to create a controller, we can just go to the console and then we'll type the Rails G controller command. And this controller could be named anything. So next we have to put the name of it. So if we we're gonna, let's say like have a pages controller where we have a few different pages. Also the controller will map it in the URL. So it would start with like pages. Although for a root, it would just go to the main URL. But we're just gonna go ahead and create our controller. So I'm gonna call it pages. And then let's just do like a home page. Maybe we'll do an about page too. So these are just like different actions. So the if you look at what this command does, it does Rails G controller, that's the name of the command. Then the first option is a pages, which is the name of the controller. And then all the other options are just actions. And an action is it means it has a template. So see how it generated a home.html.erb and it generated an about. Also, if we type in Rails routes, we can view what those what that also added, like for the URL routes. So see, this is the new routes that we have. We can go to slash pages slash home and we go to slash pages slash about because of that thing that we just generated. And then if you wanted to add any new routes, uh, you wouldn't generate if you wanted to like add more routes on the pages, you would just go and add another one in here. And then you would update also in the controller. And then in the views, you would create the template. But let's just start with the home page. Let's set this as the root. So I'll just delete the get for this. I'll say I'll just instead I'll just write root. And I'll replace the slash with the pound sign. And now this is set up so that we're rooting to the home page. And if we go and reload in the browser. Oh, I think the, yeah, the server is turned off. So let's start up the server again. And then if we reload, okay, nice. We'll see that we're on the page, uh, the home page. <coughs> Perfect. And then if we wanted to go to the about, it would just be slash page slash about. And then see, now we're on the about page. And we're back on the home page as a root. So this is pretty cool. Now this is like how to get your first kind of app set up and just mess with it. So let's say on the home page we want to add a link to the about. We could do that real quick by going back in the code. Go to the app, the views, pages, and then the home.html.erb. Now in here we could just change up some of this text. Let's say like welcome to my website. And then let's do inside this P, we'll say like learn more about 
the website. And then maybe we'll have a link that says like click here. So to add a link in Rails, you can just do, I'm gonna put it inside the P too. It doesn't really matter. So why don't I put this on a new line? So to say like learn about more about the website. And then we'd have a link that says link to click here. And now the second option is gonna be where the link goes to. So in Rails, you have URL helpers that are created by the routes. So everything you have in the routes file, you have a URL helper for. So we could either actually, we could either point this to the direct URL. So let's say like slash pages slash about. We could either write that or we could do a helper, which is like the pages about path. And this would be the same thing. So it would be the controller name and then the action and then the path. Underscore path just means like the local path. And then there's also an option underscore URL, which would include the host. So like the website URL, for example, but all right, now you see that we updated the text in here and now it's also updated the code on the browser. And then if we click there, it goes to the about page. So everything's working as expected. And by the way, the link to this just creates a simple uh, a anchor tag in HTML. So that's all these Rails helpers do is it just, it's kind of like a nice wrapper where it makes it nicer to look at for us because it's just like two things, like the name and then the URL. And then it actually creates behind the scenes. If we go and inspect element, we'll see all it created is just a, a simple anchor tag that works just as normal like an HTML site. All right, so from here, the next things that you probably would want to add is like some styling. So you could just do bare bone styling. We could start styling this without any library. And to do that, we just go back into the code, go over to the assets, style sheets, application.css. So this is already set up. It's already included. So the place that's actually included is in the layouts folder in the application.html.erb. So this is where everything, this is like the main HTML wrapper for your whole app. And then everything gets rendered in this one body. You can override this and you can have many different layouts. So you can have a separate layout. It's like we could have a pages layout where we have all of our own content just for the pages controller. You can do that too. But by default, all of your pages get rendered through the application layout. So things like the title up here, if we wanted to change, uh, see the title is actually like the thing up here at the top in the browser. We can change this text to like my first website or like whatever your text is and you'll see it gets updated and also the icon we could change that up here which it doesn't have it by default i forget what it's called <laughs> oh yeah favicon so see to change the favicon uh, it's just like this we have to add a link and it's up in the head. So see in the layouts, so this is where your head is. So if you want to add any like links for CSS, JavaScript or fonts or anything, like any type of integration that you're gonna add in the head, this is where you add it. So for me, I'm gonna put the favicon, I'll put it right next to the title actually. And then see, it's gonna try to go to a URL, which right now we don't have the images, we don't have that. So instead, uh, let's go, let's type in asset path which asset path just kind of means like, look for this in the assets folder and see in the assets folder, we already have an images folder set up. So that comes standard. And then if I want to say like, let's add an icon here. So to, to add a favicon, I would just go to flat icon and I'll just look up like whatever I kind of want. Maybe we're, maybe we do want code. And then for a favicon, I think it's, well, let's look it up. What size is the favorite column? 16 by, that's what I thought it was. So it's the tiniest one. So we're gonna download one. And Flat Icon is actually a free site. You can download icons for free, it's pretty cool. Oh, but see, I'm gonna take this, I'm gonna drag it over into my images folder in the assets. And then we have this thing called binary code now. So then I'll just put the file name in here in the asset path. And this should work. If we reload, yep, now we see we have that code. I wonder if we even need the asset path. 
we just do like binary code? Because that's the thing in Rails. Yeah, see, it wouldn't work because if we're just saying binary code, it's like looking for a URL, but it can't find the right URL that our assets are stored on. That's why we have to do asset path. Because in Rails, like the asset, actually, if we want to look at what this is, well, let's inspect the page. Go up to the head. And then let's see. Oh, lol. I guess it literally just, <laughs> oh, wait, no, because I need to reload. Oh, so see, this is what it looks like. With the asset path, it actually is like slash assets. And then they do this whole unique thing, I guess, for like the compiled name to that asset. That's crazy. So see, that's why the regular URL wouldn't work. Oh, it's just something interesting about Rails. All right, so let's get back to the styling. What I was saying is we already have, so right down here we have a style sheet link tag, which is including the application style sheet. So we already have this application.css ready to go. And anything we add in here will get affected. So let's say we want to change the body background color. If I can just set on the body, the background color, let's set it to blue. Reload, and we'll see that uh, takes effect right away. Let's say like the H1s are going to be red or something. I don't know. It's pretty bad design already. <laughs> Maybe the main text color will be oh light gray. So yeah, kind of like we're already. This is our styling. Maybe we'll we'll style the A's too. Making green. It's just gonna be a really bright site. So like you can actually this is like the this is a horrible way to style it, but it's the same as any HTML site. You can organize this better. So I was just showing you this is not a way that you want to organize it. If you're I don't know if you're new to HTML or CSS, but you usually want to add classes instead. We could still do the body though. Let's leave the body with like uh let's make this a darker site. And let's also just make like the default color lighter. Dark gray with light gray. This might look weird. Yeah, it just looks kind of boring. And then to really like tune in on these elements, let's go over to the home page and let's add a let's add a class on the H1. Let's call this like page dash title. And then I'll go back into the CSS. And then to target the class, you just write dot, put the name of the class, squiggly brackets, and then inside of here, we can target stuff, like anything about that one element. So let's try to make it bigger. Change the font size, 64 pixels. Should be pretty big. And then we could change the color. See, and then we could style from here. But a lot of people nowadays, I mean, some people do custom CSS, custom HTML. And if you're working with a designer, they're probably using a tool like Figma where they can just export the CSS and you can just drop it over into your code. So it makes it a little bit easier. But an alternative is to use a CSS framework. So there's a few options. Actually, there's so many options nowadays, but the main options are gonna be Bootstrap, which is a more minimal framework. So if we go to Bootstrap, or getbootstrap.com, we can see some examples. So they have like, oh, they even have stuff like heroes now. I wonder if this is paid though. I think a lot of their new stuff is paid. Cause I don't know where to copy the code from. Oh, well, I guess I just downloaded it. Huh. Oh, but I guess, I mean, yeah, I'm confused. But see, they have stuff like modals. I just don't know how do I get the code. They look good though. They actually look good. I guess I could just inspect. And kind of copy it. But yeah, see, so Bootstrap already has like some good to go components that look pretty good. And a lot of websites use Bootstrap. And they have like, okay, here's where you copy the components. So see, they have like accordions. They have basically every type of UI element, a modal. They have nav bars. 
Like when I was first learning, I was using Bootstrap. I was like grabbing a, a nav bar from Bootstrap, and then I was like kind of using all these different components to help me build stuff together. But nowadays, I just like build it from scratch. But it does take longer. So like, let's say we want to add a nav bar. Well, first we have to install Bootstrap. So how do we install Bootstrap in Rails? Well, the best way now is actually like the easiest way is to use the boost the Rails Bootstrap gem. Um, or no, they have a Rails Tailwind gem. Why don't they have a Rails Bootstrap gem? Maybe I'll have to I'll have to create that. I'm gonna say I'm gonna look up install Bootstrap in Rails seven. Oh, you're right. Okay, I got it. I got it now. So. First, we have to add CSS bundling rails, right? So this is like use Tailwind Bootstrap to bundle and process your CSS and deliver it via the asset pipeline. So this is kind of important. And then you would use something like Yarn Build uh, to build this, this CSS. So you only like get the CSS that you actually need. Hmm. So I guess first step is to add this into the gem file. So let's do that. Let's go back into our app, go to the gem file. I'm just gonna add in this gem. Wait, it looks like the quotes are weird on that. Okay, we're gonna add the gem. We're gonna go to the console, do a bundle. All right, and then the next thing it says is we run this command to install Bootstrap. Let's do that. Rails CSS install Bootstrap. And that's going to be from that gem that we added probably. So Okay, this is doing a lot. It's actually like creating new folders, changing some stuff. Wow, okay. And it says, this command will set up bootstrap. So then it says the third is to pin Rails UGS to import map. Okay, we could do that in a second. All right, it looks like it's already completed. So let's do that next step. So it's like something like bin import map pin. So this is the new way to add JavaScript packages. Basically is if you're just using default rails, then you do use import map. So you do dot slash bin slash import map pin, and then you put the name of the package and it'll automatically go and find a CDN package to use for this JavaScript library. All right. And then it says we just have to configure the JavaScript. So we have to do these two things. Which this was this used to be default in Rails, but they got rid of it, I guess, to make it more minimal. So we have to add that back in. Let's go. So it's just in this main app folder in the JavaScript folder, the application.js. So you'll see we already have this one line import the bootstrap stuff that was added by that bootstrap command, but we also have to add these two lines in. So I'll just do it at the bottom. So we're importing Rails from Rails to UGS. It looks like the quotes are weird too. They're like squiggly. And then we're starting Rails. All right, cool. Wait, I need to sign up to... That's crazy, okay. I'm gonna sign in real quick. Just to read the whole thing. No! Wait, I have to upgrade just to learn how to do it? Ain't no way. All right, I think the next step was just to include Bootstrap, but that's crazy. I'm gonna read this guy's article. Oh, right, Popper.js. Hmm. All right, we're just gonna add these options. Oh, and I guess we also need this in my application.js. So I guess let's delete the import all statement and we'll just leave import bootstrap. That should work too. And let's add this pin. So we're gonna pin popper and bootstrap. We're gonna add that in config slash import map All Oh, we're already pinning bootstrap. Okay. So the only thing that we probably need is popper. And if you don't know what popper is, it's for like the little pop-up menus. So I guess that's important. And then it says pre-compile. So we have to add this into config initializers assets.rb. We're in config bootstrap and popper. So do we have that config initializers? Oh, we do have assets.rb. Interesting. 
So actually it already has, it already has the code to, uh, to like compile bootstrap. Maybe we just need to add, do we just add popper then? I don't know. I don't even know if we need popper. This guy might be, this might not be a good tutorial. Anyways, let's try to grab the nav bar now. Oh, where is it? So I'm gonna go back to the bootstrap site, go to components, nav bar. I'm just gonna try to get this first nav bar. So I'm gonna click on the copy to clipboard button and then let's add it back on our site. So to do that, we're gonna go into the views folder, the layouts, and then back to this application.html file. And then inside the body, I'm going to render a new partial right above the yields. So I'm going to do the Ruby uh, code and I'm going to type render. And I'm going to render layout slash navbar. Which is going to be a partial that we're going to create right now. So in the layouts folder, we're going to create a new file called underscore navbar dot html dot erb. And then we'll just drop all that code that we got from the Bootstrap website in here. And then let's try to reload the server. So I think now that we added the Bootstrap gem and everything, we're no longer gonna use Rails S. Now we're gonna switch over to bin slash dev to run the, cause we have to run the code to compile the, the Bootstrap CSS too. So now we'll reload and we'll see that actually we do have everything working and Bootstrap is working. Uh, the drop down doesn't seem to be working though. Yeah, look, drop down's not working. That's weird. Let me check console. Oh, it doesn't know about popper. I guess that guy's tutorial was wrong. Hmm. Where's import map? Yeah, look, it doesn't know about popper for some reason. Okay, wait, let's try to. Let's just do it from the console. Let's do bins dot bin slash import map in popper and I should automatically do it couldn't find popper okay let's try popper.js bet it got popper.js perfect and let's go back to the application.js instead of import popper let's import popper.js I'll try to reload. Oh, we have to restart the server. Bin slash dev. Hmm. Weird. Now it's saying create popper is not a method. It's not a function. Let's look at the installation step. I'm confused. You can use an import map. Wait, we do use an import map. Popper JS core. I'm confused. I wonder, do we need to get that one then? All right, so let's try to go back and unpin Popper JS, and then let's pin at Popper JS slash core. Hey, okay, I think this might work. And then in our application.js, we're gonna also just import, or we're gonna actually do what they said there, right? Or no, do we just need this import all as bootstrap? Maybe we don't need to import. So let's, let's go back to our original code, import all as bootstrap. And then I think it should work. So that guy's tutorial was kind of wrong. Let's restart the server with bin slash dev. Uh, no, it's still giving me this problem. Uh, 
Oh, I need to get the bootstrap bundle with popper or something. I see. So let's go to the let's go back to the import map.rb. So see it's doing bootstrap.min. We don't want bootstrap.min. We want like bootstrap.bundle or something. Bundle.min. And let's restart the server. Now it's saying failed to resolve module bootstrap. Oh, look, this is totally, I don't know what happened. I don't know why I went to a slash. The heck? Let's try to restart. Bootstrap bundle min was not declared. Oh yeah, I forgot to compile it because the names have changed. So we have to go back. Remember how I changed that code in assets.rb in the initializer? So apparently we have to go and add this right here. Oh, and let's get rid of the popper because popper should now be included in the bundle. Let's restart the server. I'm hoping this works better. Hey, there we go. So all you have to do basically is use the bundle.min.js and then you're good. You don't need to import popper or anything. All right, so now Bootstrap is working like perfect. I'll probably have to make a whole video about this since apparently it's more difficult. Oh, so one thing, let's say we wanna get these links to, to work correctly. Let's go back in the code. We'll go into the views, layouts, and the nav bar partial that we created. And we can set these up. So one thing is in a, in a Rails app, or actually in an HTML site, the root path is always just slash by itself with nothing else. So if we want to make like, let's say this, like this is, this is like the main, like, you know, that would be like the name of your website kind of over here to make that go home. I just change the href to slash and then now it automatically goes home. And the same thing we can do that for the home link, change that to slash. And actually let's say like, instead of home, what about this one's like the about? So for, to make this go to the about page, we'll change the href. I'll do some Ruby code and I'll just go to the pages about path. We can use that helper. And then that'll also set that about link up. And then this link could go anywhere. Like you can even make this go out of, you can make this go to a different website. Cause this is just regular HTML. So we could put it like, let's say we put a link to maybe my YouTube channel. Let's put that inside of, I'll just say like my YouTube channel. How about we just say my YouTube? Let's see, and it's like the about my YouTube, this is gonna go. But what if we don't want it to, if we want it to go in a new tab so it doesn't, it doesn't navigate away from our website. We can go add an option on this link. Let's we'll say target equals underscore new and I'm pretty sure that'll make it use a new tab yeah see so now when you click it it'll actually open up in a new tab this is kind of cool and then from here you could add any more components that you want so you can keep looking at these components now that you have bootstrap set up you can add anything like modals you can add oh carousel might be fun Let's say you have like you're building a website to like sell something or to show your pictures. A carousel could be really fun. So let's try to bring this in. I'll copy this code. And let's say on the home page we're gonna have the carousel. So let's drop this in at the bottom. And then you see like you can basically have unlimited carousel items. It's just this div with the carousel item class. And then you have an image inside. So let's get a few images. So for me to get images, I go to unsplash.com. And they have all these really high quality free images. You just have to give them credit, of course. So let's just find like a few pictures to put in our carousel. So I'll just download whatever size, although you might want to think about when you're hosting it, the larger pictures are actually going to make your website load slower. That's something interesting to know, but you can set it up so that your pictures load like after, but then it'll still like look weird for the user. Anyways, there's a lot to learn in web development.
And that's why I'm making this channel so I can share it and share my knowledge. All right, so to add our images, let's go into the assets folder, the images folder, and we'll just drop our images here. So I'm gonna go to my file explorer and I'll just probably drag them over from there. So I'll just select these and I'll drag them over into my images. And I'm probably just gonna rename these to, like, I'm gonna have to be like one, two, three, because I want it to be easier. But you can name your images whatever you want. And then I'm gonna go in here and we're gonna put it as the source. So for the source, we can also just do asset path. And then we'll put like the name of the file, one.jpg. And then I'll just copy these over into the other ones and I'll update so like this one's two, this one's three. And then if we reload, uh, we should see we have a carousel, although it's really huge. And then you'll see like it already works right out of the box. We have these. And from here, there's really a lot of more things that you can do on your app. You can start adding in logic. You can start adding in integrations. Like let, you, we still haven't even added in the user the accounts. So I have tons of videos on my channel and then also there's just other resources on YouTube about this. But from here, I'll probably try to take your code, push it on GitHub. If you don't have a GitHub account, just go sign up. But it's a really cool place that you can store your code. And then you just create a new repository. You name it. So like ours is the demo app. Create the repo. And then it gives you these commands to run. So first you also have to sign in with GitHub. But once you're signed in with GitHub. And you have it installed. So like on your terminal also you have to install the Git CLI. So that you can do stuff like Git. Once you have that set up, we can just run those commands inside of here. And then we also have to add our code. So to add all the code, I just do git add dot. And then we need a message. So I'll do git commit dash m. I'll say the first commit. And then do git push to push our code up. And now when we reload, we'll see that all of our code is right here. And we have the demo app posted and it's public. So now that you have it public, there's lots of ways that you can look up how to like host your app for free. So one that I have is DigitalOcean. That's what I did in my last video. And there's this quick installer that you can do. So you create a Ruby on Rails droplet, and then you're gonna go into the console. You're gonna download this code from GitHub. So just simply go and get the HTTPS. If it's public, you don't even need to sign in too. And then in the console, you just say git clone and then you put the URL. So see if I do this, let's, well, <laughs> what the heck? Let's type in git clone. Oh shoot, I accidentally have like too much copied. But yeah, we could clone our app down. And we already have one, so let's just say like, a second option would be the name of whatever we want, like what we want to name the file that we're downloading. Really it's a folder, but we'll say like my cloned app. Now we're gonna clone it and then we can CD into my cloned app. And it's exactly the same, except for we downloaded it from GitHub. Yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this video and you learned a bit about Rails and just saw like a quick overview of what you need to get started and maybe like a few things that you can add. So yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this and stay tuned for more videos. I'm gonna be trying to post more consistently